Welcome back to AMA Junior Camp. I am so excited to see you all back here again for an afternoon conversation. This is going to be an awesome one. But uh, I'm going to start by saying uh, thank you for being patient with us. We had a couple of technical difficulties, but we found a workaround that I think will work and uh, is going to keep you guys engaged, entertained, and informed. Um, and also, I wanted to say what a great lesson this morning. Uh, Kyle TV did another awesome job of uh, presenting our version of a helicopter. Kind of looked like the Mars one, but uh, a little bit different. And uh, speaking of the Mars one, um, I'm going to get right into it because you guys have waited long enough. I know that patience is tough, but you guys knocked it out of the park. So we're going to get rolling here. And today, I am so excited to bring a very special guest to the AMA Junior Camp conversation. He's got years of experience in model aviation, and that's led him to his current job as a project manager at AeroVironment. And in this role, he's been able to accomplish some amazing things. Things like the first aircraft on another planet. That's right. Today, we'll be speaking with Matt about the Ingenuity Mars helicopter and the work he performed that makes this engineering marvel a reality. And joining us on the phone is Matt Keenan with AeroVironment. How are you doing, Matt? Great, Kyle. Uh, it's great to be with you. And hello to everybody. Uh, hi, kids. Um, yeah, so what? where do we start? Well, I was going to ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Right. Well, um, basically grew up in Southern California, and um, both my parents were kind of artistic types, uh, artists, uh, fashion design, industrial uh, design, and... Um, crafting and things like that, and we always had a lot of materials around the house for painting, drawing, sculpting, you know, arts and crafts, and uh, we just were always, me and my brother were always encouraged to build things and draw and just be creative, just try whatever, and um, I went all through public the public school system and had a few really interesting teachers. I had an uncle that was really influential and I was just really interested in how things worked and I wanted to build things and I dreamt about, you know, being an aerospace engineer when I was in elementary school um, and um, basically just kind of worked my way through. I wasn't the greatest student, but, you know, <laughs> stuck, in, stuck in school and uh, got into college and, uh, got a job and uh, and here we are today. Well, and you've always kind of been curious, excited about things. And it's so fun to hear about, you know, having access to all those different creative tools that, you know, spurred your imagination as a kid. You know, we, we try and do the same thing with our kids. Um, so, you know, I, I have great expectations for them too, especially after hearing that story from you. <laughs> well, um, right, right. So, you know, take us, through the journey a little bit in terms of, you know, you said as an elementary student, you you knew you kind of wanted to be that aerospace engineer, which a lot of, air, you know, kids in elementary school probably don't even know what that word is or what that means. Well, yeah. So I knew I wanted to be that, but I didn't know what it was called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there we <laughs> so go. If you're, if, you, if you're a kid that likes playing, you know, you get a neat, nifty mechanical toy or a car or something, and you bust it and you like, you, instead of throwing it away, you want to take it apart and see how it works or turn it into something else or try and fix it. You're basically already an engineer. You if, you're, uh, if you're interested in airplanes and you're doing that and you're fixing them and getting into them, you're basically already a junior aerospace engineer. You don't know what it's called or, you, you know, whatever. If that's what you're into, if that's what you're interested in, your passion, that's what drives you, um, Step engineering, basically, and it involves understanding how things work and then trying to make them better or more reliable or, or more or safer or, you know, allow them to work in space or on another planet, you know, to the extreme cases. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, you mentioned, you know, your, your uncle and your parents having been, you know, mentors and, and people you looked up to. But are there any other uh, educators, mentors, heroes that have inspired you in your journey? Well, yeah, so um, I was really fortunate uh, in eighth grade at uh, Paul Revere Junior High School, Brentwood, California, Southern California. I uh, had an instructor, his name was, uh, you know, Bill Warner. We always called him Mr. Warner. I called him Mr. Warner until I was an adult. Pretty funny. And <laughs> he taught French and he taught history. 
and he was an avid free flight modeler. So he built the balsa wood and tissue rubber band scale models, just gorgeous. And he had them hanging up in his classroom. And he worked out a way to actually set up an elective shop class that he would teach in his classroom for building model airplanes, teaching basic aviation history and basic uh, aerodynamics engineering. And that happened to start up right when I was a student there. It didn't happen before and it didn't happen long after I was there, but I caught that little window when he was able to do it and he would bring in his own balsa wood and glue. And I mean, they were letting us use razor blades and exacto knives in eighth grade. It was pretty impressive. That's excellent. And he could make anything fly. <laughs> He could, you could say, I want a clown standing on a guitar and make that fly. And he would cut it out of balsa wood and foam, and he would know just how to set the angles of the pieces and set the weight. And he would first toss across the, of this little thing, flew across the, the classroom, and I was just amazed. And like, how could you possibly know how to set that up and build it and then have it fly perfectly? It's like, it's like magic. And uh, it's like the extreme level of engineering. He wasn't an engineer. He was just a great teacher and a great model builder, a great mentor. Uh, so I had him for like two years, eighth grade, ninth grade. And he also had a club and we had a monthly Flight Masters West event where other really high-end modelers would come and we'd fly in our gym. That's awesome. I mean, what a great influence to, you know, see someone who's able to make magic happen in that way. And uh, what is magic except for something that you just don't know quite yet, but you're inspired to learn. And he inspired you. That's a really great story. Yeah, yeah. What next? All right. Well, here's another question for you. So the Ingenuity Project specifically, you know, it involved so many different individuals working together across many different teams um, you know, has teamwork always kind of been a part of what you enjoy and what you do? Um, you know, what are some of the things you enjoy about teamwork? You know, talk about that a little bit. Right. Well, I, you know, I mentioned my mentor. I like mentoring more junior engineers mm. and more junior technicians. The technicians are the guys that really concentrate on fabricating. The engineers concentrate more on design. And what's neat about working on a team either at AeroVironment where, where I work or with JPL uh, on the Ingenuity Project as a, as a consultant um, is learning from everybody and helping other people to solve their problem when, when they come up against something that maybe their part is too heavy, can you reduce the weight of your part? If I'm doing electronics and somebody else is doing an actuator, um, it's really fun to kind of strut your stuff, show what you can do, um, and, it's, and it ends up being kind of like a, a, a fun family kind of get-together slash group project um, when there's really nice dynamics, and it's much, it's much more enjoyable than working by yourself, um, and that's kind of the way it was with Ingenuity. It was seven years. We had the team here at my job, AV, AeroVironment, and then we had the JPL team, and we had a pretty, pretty tight, cohesive, small team here. I think we had kind of like six people as a core and then kind of 12 or 20 people as the expanded team part-time. And at JPL, there was kind of a dozen people that we dealt with a lot. And, um, yeah, that, uh, it, it, it is super important, and it, it's very rewarding. That's awesome. Well, you know, I'm going to geek out for a second and just say, you know, I, I – feel like I've said this already, but how excited it is to talk to you, you know, one of the engineers that worked on this project. I mean, we've been reading about you like in Park Pilot magazine, you know, for a while. We, you know, that was a great article. Yeah. Seeing you on the news uh, in different videos, you know, learning more about the process and the project. And of course, seven years of a journey, you know, can't be summarized in this one conversation, but you know, I'm just so excited. Um, and, and I'm going to move on to the next question, though. Um, so your experience specifically really did equip you to uh, have a lot of knowledge around the motor windings. You know, that was a specific component that, you know, from what I understand, you couldn't find anywhere else. It had to be done in-house and it had to be done by you. You know, your experience level allowed you to make that happen. And in fact, you know, we heard from Bob Ballerum, chief engineer with the Mars helicopter at JPL. And he spoke at a conference, I think it was the IEEE -E -E conference, and he said that your skill in winding right. those motors for ingenuity were paramount to the Wright brothers engineer who built the, the motor for that you know, Wright flyer. It was that integral to the process. Talk about that a little bit. Oh, goodness gracious. Okay. Well, it um, goes back to kind of the Bill Warner uh, 
junior high school days, even before that, um, went to a science, a summer science class, a Los Angeles um, uh, Museum of Science, and we had an electrical science, uh, electronic class. And you take a nail and you wrap wire around the nail and you hook it up to a huge battery, a huge one and a half volt battery, and you make the little bent piece of tin, you know, come down on and do a little Morse code. And then you do other little experiments, pick up a nail, make, kind of make it like a robot arm. And that was my first ever experience uh, winding basically part of a motor. And we had a, another another motor that we had to build for a, a model. There were these old kits called Lindbergh plastic model kits. And the early ones, they were so cheap, they didn't give you a motor. They gave you pieces of a motor. <laughs> you built the plastic model, and you actually wound the motor. And we could never get those to run, but we, you know, we learned how basically how a motor is put together. And then also would take a busted toy. Like I said, you don't throw away busted toys. You take them apart, and then you take the motor out. Then you take the motor apart, and you see how it's made. And then you you unwind the wire and you mess around with it. You use it for you know hooking up a light bulb or something. And then you think, well, I can rewire this motor. The wire's burned out. I'll take the motor the motor over here. That's good wire. It has another problem. Put it. In bad motor and so I would try and do that as a kid and you know it kind of didn't work but I started um, getting the whole process of you know hand-eye coordination and winding and getting a good magnifier and um, and then that just kind of went along over the years I would have to do different intricate little um, fabrication steps and I did a lot of radio controlled indoor helium filled blimps so I would make my own electronics or scavenge something out of a little toy car and fly these blimps around, and I had to do very delicate wiring. Um, but the, the Ingenuity motor was, was more complicated. It was it was like kind of like basket weaving with this really strange stiff wire that is actually rectangular. It's not even round, so you have to lay it down in, in strips, kind of like a ribbon. And if you twist it, just a few degrees, like 20 degrees, and then wrap it around, it'll actually bind up and it'll cause a problem. Oh, wow. So um, it wasn't so much that I knew how to do it. I knew I had enough skill set and problem-solving ability um, that I could work through it, talk to the appropriate people, just be creative and solve it. And that's what I ended up doing. I, it wasn't so much specific experience. It was my general experience and my Stubbornness. Boy, stubbornness goes a long way, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, you and you've referenced, you know, a lot of different experiences in what you've built, you know, from being a kid all the way to now. And I wonder if that's a similar story with some of the other engineers that you worked with this project on. Like how many people were were kind of familiar with model aviation? Right. So when I hired on uh, at AeroVironment, it was 1996. Most of the engineers and technicians were model a model aircraft guys, mainly RC models, but also free flight, um, scale free flight, free flight endurance, free flight, um, uh, yeah, rubber powered endurance, gas endurance, um, tow line glider endurance. Um, so we had a really good group then, and it was very fun. Over the years, we've kind of gotten more typical aerospace, so now we've got a, a greater breadth of types of people that work here. And um, so just a few of us were model airplane folks, but it's not bad. I mean, five of us had model airplane experience. I was recruited at a model airplane event for Air Environment, and I also recruited Ben Pippenberg at a model airplane event that would have been like kind of 2004, and he ended up being the lead engineer, the lead designer for the Ingenuity rotor system working with me. And now he's basic, he's almost like my boss now. So it's really cool to see the, the model the model aircraft tie-in. And we go, and we do talks at different model airplane events and clubs, and they, they just love it, because basically the Mars helicopter is a big model, a big model helicopter. It's got, you know, brushless, Outrunner motors, it's got AX servos that are very similar to RC servos, battery, lithium batteries, it's got a computer, gyros, and a radio, so yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> well, so I've got a question about the lander. Um, you know, when it came to thinking about the overall design, you know, the initial concepts, the planning, 
you know, why is it that you guys ended up landing on a, you know, twin rotor design instead of something that's more traditional, like a, a fixed wing plane, for instance, or a, a VTOL, like where it would take off and then transition to level flight? You know, basically, why isn't there a Cessna on Mars? Right. So there have been lots of studies on different different ways to fly on Mars over the decades. So I think going back to the late 1980s. Um, and what folks found out was that because the air is so thin on Mars, it, it, it's one one hundredth of the density on Earth. So what that means is if you're driving in your car on just you know on Earth normally, and you hit, say you're driving along at 40 miles an hour and you put your hand out the window and you can feel the air, the wind pressing it back. Well, on Mars, there's only one out of 100 air molecules hitting your hand. If you're driving along the surface of Mars and your Mars rover holding your hand up 40 miles an hour, you're not really going to feel anything. To feel that same pushback uh, as on Earth, you have to um, be driving at 400 miles an hour. So, <laughs> okay, so the wings work Wings work just like your hand out the window, right? Um, at 40 miles an hour, you can tilt your hand, stick it out the window, and make it go up and down. But on Mars, that ain't going to work. You're going to have to be going at 400 miles an hour. So now, if you think about flying a, a small drone on Mars, you're not going to take a huge full-size you know, Cessna or <laughs> a larger plane to Mars because it's, it's too big and, and heavy and complicated. A small drone that you might put together with RC equipment on Earth that would fly 40, 50 miles an hour. Now it's going to fly 400, 500 miles an hour on, on Mars. And it's going to be zinging past the ground. Um, you have to launch it. The stall speed is going to be hundreds of miles an hour. So you're going to have to like launch it with a rocket or it's going to have to come in from the atmosphere. But you're going to be covering the ground so fast that um, there's no way you're going to be able to land and take off like a normal airplane. Mm -hmm. And basically the same problem as if you're a, con a convertible plane, if you're a, a hybrid VTOL. Once you get into level flight, you're going to be flying so fast, you won't even really be able to um, navigate. The, the ground's going to be going by so quickly. So what people figured out is, well, if you spin the wings, you can stay in one place and just spin the wings faster, and then you've got a, a helicopter. And with the coaxial, the stacked dual rotor system, it, it, it's very compact. When you only have two rotors and they're aligned together, you don't have the tail boom, you don't have the tail rotor. So I think that was the thinking that led us to the coaxial helicopter. It, that wasn't part of my effort. That happened, you know, before I joined on the project. But that's the story. <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's a great story. It's a great you know rationale behind why you chose that route. Makes a lot of sense. So, um, you know, describe the testing process. You know, when you were working on this this vehicle, you know, what were the challenges that you guys had to face and overcome? Uh, you know, what were some of the things that stand out? Right. So the, there were multiple challenges. Um, the low density air that I was just talking about, the fact that there just isn't much air, we had to prove to JPL, NASA, you know, uh, management that it could be done. So the first thing we did is when I joined the project 2014 is we only had a little bit of time and money to do some experiments. So we made basically took small RC um, helicopters and modified them so the rotors would spin faster and they wouldn't fly apart because the rotor blades would have to spin like 10 times faster. And we would fly them in the test chamber at JPL. It's, it's about 20 feet across, like 100 feet tall, and they can, they can take the air out and make it just like Mars. Mm -hmm. And so we built these two helicopters, and um, we didn't have time to do a mathematical analysis on getting the controls just right, but we took one that you, Basically, you buy it at the hobby shop, and then we, we, we reworked them. And it's like, well, they work fine here. They should work fine if you spin the rotor blades 10 times faster. We put on bigger motors and change the gearing. Um, and uh, it didn't work. So we, <laughs> there's, there's the videos on YouTube of these little, these little guys hopping around and finally just crashing over sideways into the wall. And that was me on the, on the, on the joystick. So I was outside the chamber looking at the video screen. 
And um, what it did show is that they could take off and they could generate the lift even in the very thin air, but the controls aspect of it was not going to be trivial. And so the, the management the folks in charge said, you know, that's interesting, but it looks like you need to do the next level of testing. And then we went into the really serious uh, part of designing a real helicopter that was the full size of Ingenuity, the rotor blades. It didn't use the handmade motors that I did did later. Uh, we used um, off-the-shelf uh, brushless motors, and it had uh, gears, and it had more standard kind of equipment. But it used a flight control computer that was outside of the chamber, so it had wires hanging down for the, um, um, I think, and the, I think the power as well. I think the power and the data went up to that one. And there's videos of that on YouTube. It has the, the landing gear looks different from Ingenuity. It's kind of steeper, if you can, um, yeah, if you can see that. So that's that's kind of it. And then we just went through month after month, year after year, you know, seven years. And between the start and actually launching on the rocket of testing all the elements. And then in the end, we tested engine ingenuity itself in the test chamber. They would mount it on this very elaborate uh, robotic arm kind of system, and they would spin the rotors, and they would give it the control inputs, and they'd throttle it up, throttle it down, and they would kind of fling it sideways, and they would measure all the effects. And, um, yeah, that was very much all JPL doing, doing all those tests. And, it's very complicated, but the, in the end, you can't test it uh, on Earth. There's, you can't get the Mars gravity and the Mars air. So they had to do all this extra testing, so they had to have really high confidence that would work on Mars. Definitely. I mean, it sounds like such a interesting process, kind of a trial by fire, testing it out, getting it to the point where you think it'll work. You know, it's, it's going to be an experiment in and of itself. And I guess going along with that, Matt, like, you're probably learning things every flight, even now. Like, how do those things go into what you do? Right. So, yeah, JPL is doing the operations, and a couple of us at AeroVironment, and myself and, and Ben Pipenberg, we're on the um, the virtual meetings, looking at the data as it comes back. So that's super exciting. We're still part of the team, uh, even now that it's in operation. And um, yeah, interesting. We see interesting effects. Well, how are the servos doing? How are the, the propulsion motors that I made? How are they doing? How are the rotor blades, you know, the vibrations, all that stuff. We look at it, how are the batteries doing? They're charged, being charged by the solar rays every day. And then as it gets colder, the, so the charging isn't quite as good. And the dust, we're getting into dust season again on Mars. So the, the solar rays is getting covered with dust again. And so that's a concern. So yeah, we're learning, well, mainly JPL is learning new things every day. And when things pop up, um, sometimes it comes back to us to do a test, like on the motors or on the servo actuators or on the, the uh, mechanisms of swash plate and linkages um, to see if we can replicate an issue that, there have, that was happening on Mars. I, I mentioned to, the other, to you the other day the dust issue, so I could talk about that if you like. Yeah, of course. So um, before Flight 19... Um, there was quite a bit of a dust storm on Mars, and Ingenuity was, was thoroughly uh, covered up with dust. You can see smudges there. Um, I think that's after it's taking off, and the dust is being, yeah, the lower left foot, there's dust actually being blown off the leg. This is the camera looking down, and we're looking at the shadow of Ingenuity, and there's dust being blown off the legs, and there's a divot there where you can see the dust had kind of built up around the foot when, when it was um, sitting on the ground. But when they tried to do Flight 19 the first time, um, it didn't get through its, its pre-flight automatic test sequence where they move the servo slightly. Just like when you have a radio-controlled airplane, you know, you, 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 move the, you wiggle the joysticks and you make sure everything looks and sounds right. We can't hear it, but they have data and they looked at the current and they could see that, that they weren't right and they it automatically shut down. And so then came back to us and we looked into what was likely causing the servos to get a bit uh, sticky and we ran some tests and uh, we had meetings about that and I, I did a little demonstration it was kind of kind of cool over WebEx and it looked like what should happen is if we run the, just drive the servos hard a few times through their whole travel it should clear up enough dust to get through the flight 
and we call it the servo, the dust relieving servo wiggle. And uh, you can, there's a little article on the internet about that. And, uh, and that's what we ended up doing. Well, JPL ended up commanding that. And that's kind of a regular thing now um, because there, there, there are areas of the helicopter where once the dust gets in, there's always going to be a few tiny grains of dust in there. It's kind of like talcum powder. It's very fine. And most of it you can kind of push away, kind of like a bulldozer with the mechanism when you drive it. But there's always going to be a few particles. So, um, so now it's kind of a more regular thing that we do this dust, dust clearing wiggle nice. before a flight. Well, way to figure out how to, how to do it. I mean, I'm sure that most things that go into this are so precisely engineered, you know, that it's the tolerances are tiny. But I guess in the way of a servo, you kind of want some of those open tolerances so you can accommodate some of that talcum powder. Right. Yeah, it's very yeah. interesting. So some of it is very much open, and it allows just dust to flow through. Um, the the mechanisms where the legs unfold, mm -hmm. um, the lock, the locking mechanisms, those are all a little bit loose and very tolerant. Um, but the actual control mechanism for the swash blade and the rotor blades is very tight. And what the tight tolerances does, it keeps the big chunks of sand out, That's but the dust particles can get in, and the dust is pretty pretty much what we're having trouble with now and some things are covered so we actually have uh, dust prevention um, shields uh, to, to block out the dust and the dirt and then like in, in some other areas we, we don't do anything because it's just impractical and you know a lot of we have a lot of meetings and discussions discussions about it pros and cons the added weight the added complexity and maybe your dust if you have a little dust cover over something that's it's kind of like a plastic film can that actually get pushed into the mechanism or something, maybe sure. during launch or entry. So, yeah. You like, can't exactly go out and just fix it on your own, you know. <laughs> it's pretty no. crazy. Yeah, and you, can bear, and you can barely see it. There are only certain things the camera can see. Um, so we have to take a lot of guesses. And then and every time we do anything on Mars, there's always a risk, and it's taking up people's time. And so everything has to be thought out much more – uh, thoroughly ahead of time compared to the normal drones we do are typically for the military and we take them out to a local field we test them and we can modify them in the field if we have to you know change a prop or change a setting on the actual hardware but yeah for mars this, this is a whole new deal oh definitely <laughs> well i've got a question for you um that can't kind of came to me as you were you know discussing that dust mitigation um my assumption is with both of those rotors spinning so quickly and actually moving enough air to, to lift the weight and, and the mass that's behind it, does that also clear off the the dust that's on the solar array? Is there a way to do it that way? Yeah. So it, I don't know about the actual rotor spinning, clearing the dust because it doesn't. So the rotor, the rotor blades are below the solar array. Mm -hmm. So it's going to pull it's going to pull air past the solar array, but it, I think it's really when we do the flight. Okay. When it gets going, it gets up in the air and it leans over, and then there's, there's more airflow that's kind of sideways over the solar array. Um, but I think running the rotor blades to some extent um, helps. Yeah, it helps to some extent. But, yeah, it's um, it's unknown. We they, The JPL folks have the data, and they can they could probably give some estimate. But... Uh, it is it is a consideration because I think it was the I think spirit was it spirit or opportunity that, you know that basically died because of the the dust on the solar array so yeah it's a concern yes too, yep. bad, too bad we can't break some squeegees up and just you know refresh all that <laughs> well, yeah yep. Well, speaking of what the camera can see, you mentioned earlier that, you know, there are certain parts of the craft that you really can't view with, with the cameras that are on the craft. But I've seen some recent photos, even just yesterday, that were absolutely stunning of some of the uh, different mechanisms that brought that entire lander onto Mars. Could you talk about that a little bit? Right. So I think the most spectacular images that Ingenuity has snapped so far just, just came in the last couple of days and were just made public. And we were flying, uh, this is, I think, flight 27 or flight 26, um, flying over the debris field where the, um, the entry back shell and the parachute landed. So in the upper right is the parachute, and kind of in the middle of the images, you can kind of see some fine lines. Those are the parachute bridle lines. Mm -hmm. And then in the lower left, which looks like a crashed UFO, it basically is a crashed UFO, <laughs> because that's alien to Mars. 
right? It's coming yeah. from Earth. That's Earthlings invading Mars. Yeah. And it's round, and it came from space. So, there it is. Uh, yeah, that was the back shell. So that was the upper part of what was in, encapsulating the um, – the Perseverance rover and then the Ingenuity helicopter was on the bottom. So there's another big, there's two more big pieces that are not shown, which would be the heat shield that would have been on the bottom, mm-hmm. and then that sky crane piece, which was like the big rocket ship. Yeah. So those are somewhere else, and I don't think there's any plans to, to, to image those, but this is just wonderful. It's just the perfect height. Oh, and in the kind of on the left edge, a little up from the middle, you can see the foot yeah. of Ingenuity's foot. A little bit so of a selfie a little there. Selfie is taking the uh, taking the shot. So that is super good. Yep. That is so, so cool. When, yeah, when I saw been those many many excellent images. Yeah, when I saw those photos, that my my I had to pick my jaw up off the floor. They were just so spectacular. And, and like you say, like the perfect height, the perfect craft to, to be able to recon this and bring that data home. And if you get one data set out of this that that can you know influence future missions, like it's it's all worth it. And you mentioned, I think this was like 26 or 27. You went there and you were like, maybe we'll get a flight, but we're going to, you know, we're going to try. That's been, we're going, know, yeah, we're going for five flights is what we were trying to get to, but we were going to call success on one flight, even if it crash landed. If it took off, flew properly and crash landed on the first flight, that was going to be <laughs> called a success. I mean, but the team here at Airwire, we had pretty good confidence that, you know, we were doing a good job building it and designing it. So we kind of thought, yeah, it's probably going to, it's probably going to fly many flights. So this is, this is really exciting and it's fun to solve the problem, right? It wasn't meant to fly past five flights. So the dust wasn't going to be an issue, but we're, we're addressing it. And it's, and it's just, it's like when you have a broken, you know, toy car or whatever model, air, it's fun fixing it, right? And yeah. maybe it's not 100%, but you go out to use it again. Yeah. And um, maybe you learn something doing that little bit of repair. And, and it, yeah, it's just, it's just satisfying every day on this project. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can only imagine. And, you know, it's, it's so cool to see these images as they stream through. You know, hear about successful flight after successful flight. You're learning, you're tuning, you're tweaking. You know, this is just, it's really a celebration of, uh, of what, you know, we can do. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm so excited to see more things like this as they come through, too. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And I heard recently, uh, this was in the news, that um, the Ingenuity Mars helicopter team may or may not have received a pretty prestigious award recently. Could you talk about that a little bit? Oh, sure. Right. The, the, the Collier Trophy um, has been awarded to uh, the Ingenuity project um so it's primarily you know jpl they're the lead and um, that's a big deal so this is going back to the early pioneering days of aviation the collier trophy i think um curtis won for his very early aircraft um dr paul mccready won i think it was the late 70s early 80s for flying for his uh, leadership on the team that built the pedal powered albatross lightweight basically scaled up model airplane that that was peddled across the English Channel. So the Collier Trophy is the big deal award that comes out every year for avi- for the aviation world. And um, it's just a huge honor that um, Ingenuity has been awarded that, and, and we're super happy to be a part of that. And Ingenuity's actually won tons and tons of awards. JPL's been super busy this last year going to events and accepting awards, and, and we're, yeah, we're thrilled to be a, a part of that. Um, yeah, the, I think the actual event is coming up in a couple months, and I hope to go to that and, you know, shake some people's hands and take some pictures with the huge, I think it's eight foot tall, the original trophy. And that stays in the Smithsonian, and then the participants, the winners, the winners get a, a small version. So we're planning on uh, getting one of the small ones. So oh, that's yeah, awesome. awesome stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Two thumbs up. Oh <laughs> man. Every thumb that's uh, it's on this live stream is giving you a thumbs up. So that's yeah. amazing. Um, there are a couple of questions. I can't see the, the first question, uh, but maybe if we put it on the screen, I'll be able to see it a little bit better. There we are from Joel. How does the test chamber simulate the Mars atmosphere? Okay. Yeah, so there's two steps. So we need to pull out all of the air that's in the chamber uh, initially, and there's a whole room next to the chamber 
that looks like the engine room of a, a U.S. Navy cruiser, which I actually have been in. So it's got these same crazy um, pumps and just belts and fans. and So you suck all the air out, and then what you do is you allow some uh, carbon dioxide to come back in to just just to the level that gives you the Martian atmosphere of CO2 because there's no oxygen on, on Mars. I don't think there's much nitrogen. So we, we, it's called backfilling. You put the air back in, but it's the right kind of air. It's dry, not wet, and that there's like no water molecules of CO2. And when you do that, it changes the Mach number. So that's when things go supersonic and the drag really comes up. So if you're really trying to get accurate aerodynamics um, measurements on Mars, you need to use the low density in CO2, not Earth air. It's really interesting. Uh, there's another question uh, from Yar Smith. What would you like to see on Ingenuity 2, the next version? Well, so we've published a paper um, talking about some of our ideas at Air Environment, and we, we published an idea where we have four-wheel drive rover wheels on, on the ends of the legs of Ingenuity, and then some sort of an arm and a gripper to potentially take rock samples or you know do some interesting science because it could fly to different areas quite quickly, take small samples, and maybe bring them back to uh, a lander or an, or an analysis um, you know, device on a lander. Um, so that's one thing that, that we're thinking about. Um, we're open to whatever JPL and NASA are interested in doing, and we hope that we're allowed to bid on whatever happens next. <laughs> it's been a big success, so I think they're going to want to do something. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, okay, so I've got another question for you, and it might be the Ingenuity Project. I think it might be if I were in your shoes. But the question is, you know, what is the most fun that you've had in aviation? Okay, so... I've had some really bizarre experiences in, in full-size aviation. I took a uh, ride on the Goodyear blimp in the 1970s. That was cool. Um, been on a few small planes, Cessna and, and uh, a Mooney. And, uh, oh, I took the – there used to be a float plane that flew between Santa Monica and Catalina Island in Southern California, and I went on that as a kid. And you actually sat in a little seat in the center – the center line of the fuselage was the center of the, the, I guess, the pontoon. And when that thing landed in the water, I mean, you were just banging on your butt. I mean, it was it was crazy, but it was super thrilling. Um, but I had this great ride in a in a glider um, over the Grand Tetons Mountains. Uh, I, don't know, uh, I don't know, fifteen years ago, and took a ride, and the pilot's in back, and I'm in front, and I had told her, you know, about my experience in radio control fly and drone flying and, you know, we're up there gliding back and forth slopes. And I told her I did slope soaring, radio control, glider slope soaring. So she said, oh, you know what? I want to eat my sandwich. Can you just take over the control? I said, I got, I got no flight training full size. She said, oh, you'll be fine. You know, the six there, rudder pedals. So I'm starting to fly it and realize that, you know, the rudder's backwards, because I thought when you push the right foot forward, it's like when you're on a tricycle as a kid, it turns left, but on a plane, it actually turns right. So I figured, <laughs> I figured that out. But the Grand Tetons, the mountain range, beautiful, beautiful mountain range with the, the partially snow-covered uh, areas and just the woods, and it was just fantastic. So that was probably my, my most enjoyable full-size aviation experience. But with models, I think it's been flying FPV airplanes. So small, um, like Horizon Hobby, I think it's called the Striker, the uh, pusher plane, the camera in front, and flying two of those with my friend, you know, through trees and just all over the place doing, you know, loops and rolls and trying to fly inverted. Um, I'm not really a stunt RC guy. That is just, that gets, you know, I'm shaking. I've got the adrenaline going. I, I'm laughing laughing like a little girl, you know, it's, it's, it's fun stuff. So I think that's, those are kind of some of my most memorable aviation related experiences. Yeah. FPV is definitely probably the closest I'll ever get to being in a fighter jet. Like you just feel like you're in there doing all the things. Right. You're, you're doing these G's that you would never be able to survive, <laughs> no. and, but you're experiencing it visually and emotionally. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Good it's stuff. Definitely good stuff. 
Well, um, another quick question for you, and uh, this kind of gets back to some of the kids that are watching right now. You know, what is your advice uh, to kids who who are thinking about getting into aviation that are enjoying it? You know, uh, do you have anything that might be you know just basic advice for for anyone in whatever uh, avenue they want to go through? Yeah. Well, yeah. There's, so there's lots of different areas to get into with aviation. You get into full size planes. Um, you can get into drones. Um, get into designing models as a living it's, it's, that's a tough one <laughs> but um the idea is to follow your passion and if you're if you want to do engineering you're actually going to enjoy taking the math and the physics the science classes through high school and college and you're actually going to enjoy it it's hard but if, if your mind is such that you like finding out how things work that's what that's a good way to go if you're more interested in the you know, like piloting and doing doing test flying or working on Cessnas um, that's a slightly different tack you may want to go to a technical college or you may skip college altogether and just hang out at a small airport and just say hey mister what kind of plane is this why is it special can I take a look at it can I sweep your hanger can you you know give me a ride if I sweep, sweep your hanger a few times um, and if you know anybody that's interested in radio control models or other flying models, talk to them, you know, see if they'll share their experiences with you. I was super shy. I didn't do that. Only, you know, I only did that with my, my teacher and my uncle because I was, I had to be there, but I couldn't walk up to people and, and at the model field. I just went and looked and then I went back and tried to teach myself how to fly RC and I just crashed a lot. It was, it was pretty bad. If you can, Get the guts to ask somebody, hey, mister, can you help me fly this plane that I just bought or I just built? It's really good. But, yeah, education is good, And but learning on the job, like learning. I worked in a hobby shop. I learned so much at that hobby shop. They would have me repair things, and they'd say, hey, you know, can you build this glider, wander, dental lady? We're going to sell it. It's like, okay, normally I wouldn't build those, but you're going to, you know, pay me to build it and then hang it up. You know, I covered it with the Monaco. It was, it was a great experience, and that actually led me to my interest in electronics. Mm -hmm. So my first job was mainly electrical engineering and software, and I just designed uh, a homemade um, RC transmitter. It was, uh, I believe it was four channels, and it had a digital processor in it, and that would have been 1986. Oh, and wow. It had an LCD and buttons. Yeah, this is early, and it had a huge battery on the back, and it used an ACE RC RF modulator so i didn't do the, the the actual radio wave part but all the encoding all the reading of the joysticks i programmed that myself based on what i learned at work and my boss at that time he was a mentor uh zach bogart and uh he was a model guy he was a silent, silent flyer he had he did that crazy whatever number of hours you fly constantly gliding he did that yeah. anyway but I did this transmitter, and I set it up for memorizing and playing back maneuvers. So I'd hit a button, I would do like a barrel roll, hit stop, and then I could hit the button to play it back, and it would play back the, the maneuver. But it would add it would add the joystick, so you could tweak it. And so I did that for slope scoring, and I could hit this little button. And it wasn't just holding the controls over, hard over. It was actually stepping through the controls. Oh, wow. And that actually came from my job with, with Zach, because he did motion control, for like the movies, the right stuff, and Star the first Star Wars movie where they had to step the models and take the images of it. So I use that thinking to step the controls for a slope soaring glider live while it's flying. And uh, it's really fun to have a job you're passionate about, and then it folds into your hobby, or you make it fold into your hobby. You say, what can I apply? How can I apply it? So. I don't know if that answers the question, but <laughs> some stories there. <laughs> no, definitely really neat. You know, it, it's just like you say, you know, the things that you're curious about that you learn and pursue will always have an impact on everything that you do from there on. You'll remember, oh, this worked here, or, or I think it could work in this situation. And, you know, it's just an awesome process as as we all learn and grow. So really neat to hear. Yep. One more, yep. one more question. This is the last one I've got written down. Um, what did I miss? Okay. What, what should I have asked you? Oh, goodness gracious. I mean, I can talk for hours on any topic. Um, uh, da, 
da, da. So I did have a lot. So I talked a little bit about my first professional job and doing the RC transmitter when I came to Aero Arm in 1996. There was, you know, a whole level of new technology, and we um, one of the engineers had some data sheets for the little key fob uh, car alarm things. Little, you know, press it on your keychain and opens opens your car. Mm-hmm. And it turned out the receiver on that was a little tiny chip, about a half inch by half inch by sixteenth of an inch. And I thought, ooh, let's use that as a micro radio control, uh, as a receiver. And so I took that digital transmitter work that I did before. That was a big, huge thing. And instead of using the ACE RC 72 megahertz, I was using a 433 megahertz car alarm radio and pick chips. So I got into pick chips, the 8-bit microcontrollers in the 90s. Those were kind of the popular ones. They still have them. And then so I made up this little receiver with a little computer, a little tiny thing, postage stamp. And then another guy at work at AeroVironment found these little motors from Switzerland that were um, about an eighth of an inch diameter and about a quarter of an inch long, and they're stepper motors. Mm -hmm. And I learned how to drive those. So then I put that with the receiver, and I was able to step those little motors, and I made servos out of those, basically. And so I made some of the lightest weight radio control proportional equipment that had ever been developed. And I actually donated my Eindecker to the AMA, um, which was a peanut scale, basically converted plan form of a, a Walt Mooney rubber band model into foam with radio control three channels. And that had a really long endurance off of just, I think, one or two NICAD batteries were in that plane. It's so and cool. um, that led me to doing the lightweight and micro airplanes at Air Environment, which I kind of became known for. And that includes the, the Nano Hummingbird, um, which used some of the same techniques of miniaturization and, and adapting hobby hobby techniques, but also just creative problem solving. And we've got a watchmaker's lathe for making like tiny gears and tiny shafts. The tiny, um, tiny and in my lab here, I wish you could see it, um, has microscopes and all kinds of crazy equipment. I got model airplanes hanging from the ceiling. I've got all kinds of little knickknacks, planes, helicopters, drones sitting here on my table. Very inspirational. <laughs> That's awesome. So. I did see one chat question come through earlier, and I think it was from Paul, or, or it was re- referencing Paul McCready. Um, you know, what do you think he yeah. would think of FPV and like modern RC now in these days? It was from Stephen. Uh, yeah. So, so Paul is. So I met Paul many times. He he, he um, founded the company, and he loved. He lived in Pasadena, but he loved coming out to our Simi Valley office because it's where we were doing the aircraft work. The, we were doing electric vehicle work in Monrovia, closer to where he lived. But he loved coming out, and my lab was kind of a neat little area, so he would always check in with me, and sometimes he would say, oh, I got this idea for, for making this thing. Can you just like do this after hours and put it together? Um, and he loved adapting new technology. He would buy something and bring it in, whether it was hobby or it could be anything, anything. And so, yeah, he would have been all over FPV and modern uh, radio control equipment and adapting to something strange that you or I couldn't even dream of. Mm -hmm. (laughs) His brain was just operating on another level. And um, you could have a meeting with him that would have a particular topic. But it would always end up going to whatever Paul was working on. He, you know, <laughs> and it was fascinating. And it was totally cool. He led an effort to make a hamster-powered model airplane for a student kind of STEM project. So a hamster spinning on a wheel inside of the fuselage of a really lightweight airplane uh, fly around in the gymnasium. and <laughs> That's probably how he felt over the English yeah, yeah, Channel. You know, yeah, so that's probably what inspired him. Let's do a small version for kids, and we'll use a small mammal. But I think I don't think the the hamster has the same power to weight ratio as a ripped uh, bicyclist, because that's what ended up going across the channel. Yeah. So yeah, Paul Paul loved hobby stuff, and he loved adapting new stuff, and and just thinking about what can you do with it. And yeah, it's a shame he, he's gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Definitely miss him. Well, ah. Matt, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. I, I can't say enough uh, uh, how much I enjoyed the conversation. I have a feeling that those who viewed it did as well. And, uh, you know, once again, this is all part of AMA Junior Camp. 
Uh, you know, we're excited to bring this into the community of aviation, of model aviation specifically in some ways, but really we're about inspiring uh, that love of, of flight in all its forms, whether you're Excellent. turning a wrench on a plane at, at, you know, in a hangar, whether you're working at your bench at home on an RC plane, uh, whether you're winding up a free flight plane, you know, we love it all. And it's really been an honor to speak with you today, sir. Well, thanks so much, Kyle. It's been great speaking with you. I love your questions, and I love your, your attitude, and I love what you're doing with, with the kids. Um, it's excellent stuff. So um, I guess until next time, we'll, we'll say adios. Well, it sounds great. Well, thanks again to Matt for joining us in that conversation. Uh, I, I really I, I kind of geeked out a little bit. I had a lot of fun. Hopefully you did too. Uh, remember, though, camp isn't over. Junior camp is going to hit the uh, inboxes again uh, in an email. If you've already registered, you know, look out for that email and uh, come into the lesson tomorrow morning. Uh, you can go to amaflightschool.org and learn more about our junior camp, learn more about our programs, our activities. You know, we offer so much. Uh, for you guys to enjoy. We hope you do. If you have any questions, of course, reach out to us, education at modelaircraft.org. That's a great way to get a hold of us. Uh, myself or someone on the team will jump in and uh, be quick to respond. And um, don't miss tomorrow, too. Uh, it's something special in the afternoon. So we're still having that conversation period. We're going to be speaking with Red Jensen, uh, who is uh, over at NASA. He works in the subscale model team uh, there at the Armstrong Research Center. It's going to be a great conversation. We've had Red on before, and uh, he's got a few things he's working on. He may have teased them last year, but this year uh, he's making some even better real progress on them. So it'll be a lot of fun. And uh, we're kind of going to be trying to you know, weasel our way into the AMA air broadcast. We'll see if we can't uh, knock them off the air and take over. Fingers crossed. We'll see how it goes. But until then, you know, if you have questions, reach out. We uh, so look forward to hearing from you guys. And uh, we'll catch you later. Bye-bye.